Thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm going to speak today about uh, something that's uh, completely different from what you heard about yesterday. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say there'll be no um, Byzantine generals and uh, no blocks will be um, mined in the making of this talk. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about something kind of at the interface between uh, microeconomic theory and computer science. And, and that interface is going to be especially sharp because the first half of the talk is really going to sort of put on an economist hat and think about the design of a market. And then the second half of the talk is going to shift to thinking more like a computer scientist and asking some questions about uh, how to do um, some key computations that arise in that market. So the kind of pretext for this exercise is a particular auction that happened uh, over 13 months in 2016, 2017. Um, sometimes it can seem a little bit strange to, to talk about you know, some war story of you know, one big thing that happened in industry once, but, but I hope I can persuade you that, uh, first of all, this was a pretty uh, interesting and high stakes exercise, and, and secondly, that there's really general uh, lessons that can be learned about how to make a big decisions uh, with multiple stakeholders and uh, complicated computational issues that arise. Uh, so this particular auction, um, which has, if, if you work in game theory, uh, you'll be really dismayed to know that it was called the incentive auction. Uh, that name is actually in legislation, so we can't change it. Uh, Congress decided that that's what the auction is called. Uh, if you're not in game theory, you might wonder why you should be dismayed. It's because all auctions give rise to incentives. That's kind of the whole point. There's no such thing as an incentive auction, except now there is. Uh, so the, the incentive auction uh, was an exercise by the United States to repurpose radio spectrum from television broadcast to mobile broadband. And uh, the reason for doing this was, you know, over time, um, you know, those of you business section of the newspaper may be aware that radio spectrum has been getting auctioned off by governments. And uh, they, they make absurd amounts of money, you know, selling companies the right to exclusive use of some narrow, you know, range of colors of light uh, within a particular geographic area. And that turns out to be worth billions of dollars. And so governments discovered this and it was great. You know, it's a way of getting a whole lot of money while simultaneously making consumers and companies happy all at the same time. Uh, that doesn't come along very often. Um, but, but the problem is they, they ran out of colors of light. Right? There's only so much radio spectrum out there. And essentially, all of the usable radio spectrum in the United States at this point is allocated to something. And nevertheless, people want to watch Taylor Swift videos on the bus. So you know, something needs to be done. And uh, what, what they kind of looked to was the fact that when radio spectrum started getting allocated um, back in the kind of 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, th there wasn't that much um, competition for the spectrum at the time. And so it was given, you know, big chunks of really good spectrum were given off to television broadcast. Um, and now, not very many people watch television over the air. So just out of curiosity, uh, how many of you uh, watch television uh, over the air, which is to say you have an antenna in your home that receives TV signals? Is this the first room I've spoken to that has nobody? There, there's like one person in the back who's really embarrassed, who's putting his hand up really small. It's less than once a week. <laughs> well, that's a yes. OK, yeah, good for you. But, but you're old, so it doesn't count. Uh, so, so as you can see, you know, there, there are people who do this, but there aren't really that many of them. Um, so you know, maybe this isn't, it, how many of you, you know, have ever watched um, a video, let's say some like really high bandwidth use over like a, a data network on your phone? I don't know what the rest of you are doing, really. Do you just have a hand injury or something? And, but, but anyway, more of you, right? So, so it seems like maybe a reallocation would make sense. Uh, so, so the FCC did this. This talk is going to be kind of the story of how that came to pass and some interesting economic and computer science questions along the way. Um, and uh, in, in total, this auction made the government, uh, or, or rather grossed the government, about $20 billion US, um, or, or to put it in terms that would make more sense to you, about $25 billion Singaporean. Yeah? Just one short question. So when, when the government sells me a frequency, right, isn't it That, that, that's a great question, and I think two to three slides from now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to that issue in detail. So, so let, me, let me put a pin in that, but, but you're, you're right to wonder that. Uh, the, the short answer is that you know, back in the 50s, um, property rights weren't so clear the way they set things up. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but uh, I made the mistake of trying to indulge you. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let, let, let's see. 
So, uh, so anyway, all, all of which is to say the government took in about $20 billion. Um, then they paid um, the broadcasters whose spectrum they gave up, uh, which is partly an answer to, to your concern, um, for voluntarily re relinquishing their licenses. They cleared 14 TV channels. So there are 14 TV channels in the United States that are no longer TV channels. They're now cell phone channels. And uh, they, um, all the stations that didn't sell uh, were assigned new, potentially new channels uh, to fit as densely as possible into the channels that remained. And the government um, you know, took in uh, $20 billion, paid out over $10 billion, had to pay a whole lot of costs to do with retuning and fancy consultants. And uh, the, the result was that they kept over $7 billion in profit. Um, so so that's, uh, that's how this whole thing shook out. Um, here's, uh, in my little corner of the project that really just had to do with the economic design and the uh, computational stuff, here, here's uh, a partial list of the people who were involved. This was a massive thing. So I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that you know, I did this by myself in my garage. This was uh, you know, all kinds of people. Um, the market design effort was led by Paul Milgram and Ilya Segal, who are economists at Stanford. Um, my little computational corner of the market design piece was uh, uh, heavily uh, influenced by my students, particularly Neil Newman, a PhD student of mine, uh, actually wrote the code that ran during the auction, which is a nerve-wracking experience for a student to have your research code running in a $20 billion auction. Um, <laughs> luckily, as far as we know, it didn't crash. Um, but Neil had some sleepless nights over 13 months. Um, many colleagues of mine at UBC contributed to papers that eventually led into this thing. Um, other like summer students uh, contributed to code that eventually made its way into the auction. And there was a huge team at the Federal Communication Commission and at Auctionomics, which is Paul Milgram's uh, auction consulting company that, uh, that also contributed to all of this. And we were funded by the Canadian government in various forms and by Auctionomics. So, let me now turn to the, uh, the economic side of this thing. And uh, for this half of the talk, I'm going to be um, following a, a, a 2017 uh, PNAS paper uh, that, that kind of talks about this auction design. So uh, if you kind of hear algorithmic game theory talks sometimes, I imagine some of you do, uh, you might be used to those talks beginning with a very clear algorithmic formulation of something needing to be optimized and certain valuations by different participants, and then kind of how do we approximate that function. And I think something that was really interesting for me about this exercise was that it didn't look anything like that, because there was really a lot of underspecification and freedom in the design process for deciding uh, what was going on at all, uh, how we should formulate this thing, what we should optimize, and what we should approximate. Um, it went beyond just the, the choice of mechanism, which is usually what our field uh, puts almost all of its interest into. So we had to think about things like uh, property rights. What do people own? Uh, what, what rights did they have to the things that they owned? Um, what goods should the, trade, uh, should the market actually trade? Um, how much should it decide to trade? So it needed to make a decision not only about um, what changes hands, but how much changes hands. Um, should the market care about efficiency, which is to say putting goods into the hands of, of the, the parties that want them the most? Um, which makes a lot of sense, because if you're the US government, you care about making efficient use of, of these public resources to eventually stimulate your economy and have people's phones work better. You know, or should you care about revenue, because after all, we're talking about billions of dollars. Or should you care about downstream effects on the consumer market by, for example, trying to protect new entrants and increase competition in the, in the market, so maybe favoring small players so that there'll be more downstream competition. Um, or should you worry about things like many TV stations are owned by small businesses, kind of mom and pop operations that aren't very economically sophisticated and making the rules simple enough that they'll be able to understand and participate and not get screwed. Um, often, you know, sometimes these things are a little bit compatible with each other, but often they, they pull pretty directly against each other. So how, how should those kinds of trade-offs be resolved? That, that was a, that, that's what I'm going to speak about uh, for the next little while. And um, why am I, as a computer scientist, talking to you about all of this? Uh, because computational tractability uh, just comes up again and again. Anytime you want to think about any of these issues um, in a, a market as complex and as combinatorial as this one was, um, it's really necessary to think about computation kind of all the way along. So, so let me now um, talk about uh, Yair's question about uh, property rights. 
Um, turns out that the law was completely unclear about um, what property rights broadcasters actually had for, for their television stations. They never paid for them. Um, back in the sort of early days, they would make a application to the FCC and say, hey, I want to open up a, a new television station in Iowa. Iowa doesn't have any television stations right now. Wouldn't it be cool if it did? You know, I'll build a tower. I'll, I'll, everyone will get the Tonight Show or whatever people watched in the 50s. I have no idea. Um, you know, wouldn't that be great? And, and the FCC would say, you know, you seem like a fine, upstanding young man. Have a TV station. And, and then you know, there you are. And so you know, downstream, now that this spectrum has become very valuable, what, what's the right thing to do? Um, you, you might think the, the government should just take this spectrum back and give it to the right people. Uh, if you think that, you've never met the Republican Party in the United States. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. That would have uh, triggered a, a long, messy legal battle that, that nobody had the appetite for. Um, on the other hand, if you've ever visited the Chicago School of Economics, um, you might think the opposite thing. You might uh, take this famous argument from uh, Coase that says, um, why don't we just let everybody trade with each other? I mean, why is the government thinking about designing an auction here at all? You have, if, if people lack property rights, the mistake is that you should give them very clear property rights and then let them trade with each other and everything will be great. Um, and uh, Coase actually made this argument in a paper about the FCC back in, I think, the 60s. Uh, and uh, he, he made very, there he is looking uh, as distinguished as only he can do. Um, and, uh, and he made the argument that all you need is for property rights to be clear and for there to be no frictions in the market. Uh, unfortunately, this setting gives rise to, to a, a pretty painful friction, which is called holdout power. What does that mean? Well, it, it turns out that uh, tel uh, wireless companies don't, don't really want your lousy little television station in the middle of Philadelphia that has lots of other television stations all around it in New York and in, you know, whatever to the west of Philadelphia. Um, they, they, they want a big contiguous block of spectrum that's sort of many television stations wide and that doesn't have interference on the edges. And that means they would have to buy up not just your station, but a whole bunch of different stations all over the place to get this big, clear, contiguous block of spectrum. And why is this a problem? Because if I figure out that all of my neighboring stations are getting bought up by AT&T, then suddenly I become really valuable to AT&T because I have what's called an economics holdout power, which means I can, I can sabotage the entire transaction by threatening that I won't sell. And I can then demand an amount of money that doesn't really depend on my own value, but that depends on AT&T's value for the entire transaction. And the reason that this is especially problematic, besides the sort of moral story that sounds like I shouldn't be getting so much money for my television station, is that everybody can do this, right? Everybody can simultaneously try to hold out, and, and that can lead to really catastrophic failures of efficiency. Um, uh, if this is a little bit difficult to picture, um, think about uh, selling land. You know, imagine that you want to build a shopping mall, which I know in Singapore is a pretty easy thing to imagine. And uh, imagine that you have lots of little property holders, um, you know, each of whom own you know, a little bit of the land along the river, and you want to you get a big you know, chunk of land. It's pretty hard to buy them up one at a time in a way that you know, will eventually give you this big contiguous chunk of land. Uh, that, that's holdout power. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're definitely not going to use VCG. Um, we are still going to come up with something that's incentive compatible. Um, VCG is not the only thing in the world that's incentive compatible. VCG is the only thing in the world that's incentive compatible and efficient. So we're going to end up uh, trading off some efficiency. And then uh, we're going to end up with something that doesn't have provable efficiency guarantees. And we're going to um, do sort of computational simulations to argue that we're close to efficiency. Uh, by, by the way, I really appreciate the questions. Uh, I, you know, in the tradition of economics talks, I'd like you to interrupt me as much as possible. You've already let me get through several slides, which means this isn't an economics talk. But, uh, but I, I welcome questions from also this part of the room. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, indeed that would not have worked out in the United States, um, but. Uh, to take that comment seriously, I mean, maybe that, that's meant kind of tongue in cheek, but to take it seriously, what's tricky about that, okay, so what's tricky about that is that uh, a central authority has difficult knowing all of the private information that the participants have. 
So a central authority would need to figure out how much is this spectrum really worth to AT&T. You know, AT&T claims that they want 600 megahertz spectrum, but if they don't get it, you know, would they instead um, you know, densify their existing towers and do cell splitting instead? And how much would that really cost them? They claim it would be really costly. And if we gave it to T-Mobile, would they actually expand right away? Or are they just kind of blowing smoke about that? And this television station says they don't really want to sell, but really, would they be willing to sell? Uh, the problem is people will lie to you because it, it really helps them to lie to you. And so uh, this is where the, the previous comment about incentive compatibility comes in. You, you want to design a market that makes it necessary for people acting in their own interest to reveal truthful information, because otherwise it's really difficult to centrally make a good decision if you don't know the, the right inputs. Yeah. That's right. The government does have the power to do exactly that. Just sort of, especially in this case, which is problematic, they did it on, in the needs of a private, sort of private developer. So, I mean, so that notion exists for actual property. I'm surprised that you're saying it didn't work for sort of virtual property of this kind of the airwaves, public property. So, I'm not saying it doesn't work. Uh, I'm saying I don't think that that theory has been tested about something like uh, radio spectrum. Uh, uh, this was passed uh, at the time of a Republican Congress, and I think there was no appetite for expanding the government's eminent domain powers. Uh, it, it might well have been that that, that could have worked. Um, eminent domain would have been tricky here for the reasons we just discussed, because you still would have to figure out what you should confiscate and you know, what social good would follow. It's a lot trickier in a kind of combinatorial optimization setting like this than in the sort of shopping mall example. Um, but, but I don't mean to say that couldn't have been done, just, just that nobody wanted to do it. Yeah. Why does AT&T care where, you know, okay, so I'm going to take not this bit of the stuff, I'm going to take this bit. So why, I mean, it seems like holdouts should at least in theory not have as much effect because, you know. So, so I, I think what I'm starting to figure out is that you're going to ask me about my next slide for the entire talk. Um, but uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether you are or not, but it sounds to me very likely that, that you are. Um, I, the reason AT&T cares about this bit of spectrum rather than that bit is that signals spill over. So there, there's interference kind of at the boundaries of one area. So AT&T really doesn't want like a little bit of spectrum here and a little bit of spectrum there. I get why they need contiguous blocks. That I get. Yeah. But I don't get why they need this contiguous block. So if there's one like annoying person here that doesn't want to give me something, can't I start negotiating with, you know, like bandwidth 10 to 20? Okay, fine. 10 to 20 has a more dramatic person here. I'm going to go with 20 to 30 and like take some of the next scene. Okay, so that's not quite my next slide. Did that? That's a good idea, but, but you would quickly see that you know, a small group of people could still hold out. So if you have like evenly spaced... Yeah, and especially because you want the same chunk of spectrum across a really wide geographic area, uh, you know, a, a pretty small, like, you know, a, a very small subset of holdouts could still really, uh, really sink you. So um, that, that, that would help you, but it would only really help you a bit. You'd also have a problem with spectral efficiency because it turns out that between different uses of spectrum, you need guard bands. You need some wasted dead space spectrum to make sure that there isn't interference. And if you really had this kind of Swiss cheese of like fitting things where you could, you would need guard bands all over the place. So, which means you're basically burning some some goods, right? Um, so, there's also yeah, there's different propagation characteristics as it turns out. We're not talking about a wide enough range of spectrum that's a first order concern, but it is true. Yeah. Um, and, and the companies really do have different values for slightly different um, spectrum, not, not enormously different, but they, they do value them differently. Um, so, so let me, uh, so here's something that uh, Congress really got right. Uh, this was, uh, uh, the, the solution to this problem uh, was to redefine property rights in a, in a subtle but important way. So um, what Congress um, did in the, um, only the U.S. Congress can pass something called the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. Um, this was, I, I, I like to point out, the least productive Congress in history. It only passed seven bills in 2012. Uh, actually, at the time, the least productive Congress in history. I haven't kept up. It might be getting less and less productive with time. But, uh, but this was one of them, and it did, uh, in the manner of the U.S. Congress, many, many things all at the same time. But, but one of them was to uh, 
give the SEC the legal authority to run this auction by redefining this property right, uh, and also to stick us with the name incentive auction, which we're now stuck with. Um, but what it said is that the stations have uh, the right to keep broadcasting if they don't sell, but they don't have the right to keep the exact channel that they currently have. They're on they only have the right to a functionally equivalent channel uh, with comparable levels of interference to what they had before. So what this kind of means in the, in the property sense is, you know, if you won't sell your little shack by the river, the government will move you to a, li a different little shack by the river, but it might not be the one you had before. A and in that way, it becomes a lot easier for the shopping mall to, to buy up the land it needs because it needs to buy the right amount of land, but it doesn't need to buy it all in the right place. And then people will get shuffled around to make this, this big open uh, block. So, so this is kind of an extension of, of the idea that you were pursuing, that you can reduce uh, holdout by making bidders substitutes for each other. Yeah, so, so the, I mean, really the economic concept is, is substitutability, right? You want to make it the case that if I don't trade with one guy, I can trade with another guy, that the two people are substitutes. Uh, and once that happens, then competition is increased because those bidders have to fight with each other to give me a better deal. Um, so how much spectrum should we clear? Um, so I, I talked about guard bands. Um, it turns out even deciding, let's say we were going to clear 84 megahertz of spectrum, you know, what, which TV stations exactly should go away and what should happen and how much stuff would there be to sell. That was a process that took years and, you know, many reports were written and many countervailing proposals were issued. And th this was the eventual answer. Um, so uh, the white things here are TV stations. The blue things are... Um, so, so all of this used to be TV, all the way up to here. Um, channel 37 is spectrum. It gets, uh, is special. It gets used for radio astronomy. And you can't change the radio telescope, so you have to leave channel 37 alone. Um, you need a guard band. That's this uh, little shaded thing. Then the blue things are the, uh, the new spectrum that's going to get sold off. And the blue things are paired because uplink and downlink turn out to happen in different places. Um, so. If I was to clear 126 megahertz of spectrum, here's what the band plan would be. If I was going to clear 114, here's what the band plan would be, and so on. So, um, so if I was going to clear um, 126 megahertz of spectrum, I would get blocks A through J. So I would get 10 blocks to sell off. If I only cleared 42, I would only have two blocks to sell off. Um, th this was eventually decided painfully that this, this would be the plan. But, it, but we still didn't know which of these plans we should adopt. So should you know, did the market actually have a desire to clear 126 megahertz of spectrum? Or, or was there actually much less interest in the 600 megahertz block than we had thought? Um, that was hard to know because people were all saying different things. We didn't know who to believe. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation happening. Yeah? What, what is the scale of this? Like how, much, like how, much, how many of these channels does like, uh, Comcast use? Like, I don't know, like some data horizon? What's the I mean, the, the channels are relatively the densely the used. Data? Uh, each channel is uh, six uh, megahertz wide. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you, but that's true. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how to answer your question. I mean, what units do you want the answer in? Like how many, okay, so how many, how many channels does a, like a large company need? I mean, you just saw how many hands went up when we asked how many people watch TV over the air. I think besides you, it was two people, right? Uh, so, I mean, it's not clear how many, how many channels can you watch at the same time. We could have three channels, one for each of you, and you can, you can have whatever you want. Um, it, it's not clear. I mean, this doesn't stop them from broadcasting over cable. This really only stops them from broadcasting over the air. Presumably, you know, the whole goal of this is to have the stations that nobody really watches be the ones that go off the air. So, so that's where, you know, it, some station that has a lot of viewership presumably is not going to be the station that's willing to sell. So uh, that's what this whole exercise is meant to find out. Um, and you know, if it turns out that you know, T-Mobile doesn't really care that much about buying new spectrum and Comcast really wants to hold on to its channel, you know, th that's exactly what this slide is about. You should then decide not to transact very much spectrum because it turns out that the TV stations are pretty valuable. I mean, going in, we don't know. That, that's what we're trying to find out uh, through the market. So uh, the kind of standard economic solution to this question would be to say, let's trade the quantity of good for which there's a market clearing price where supply meets demand. So, so I would imagine some of you, while I've been putting up this slide, have been thinking to yourselves, well, I don't know, you should find out where supply and demand meet, and that, that's how much you should trade. Uh, turns out that that's a, kind of a slippery concept in this setting because we don't have a homogenous good. I mean, I, I can talk about supply and demand meeting when I'm talking about Apple stock trading in the stock market, but here every good is slightly different, and every, um, 
every buyer is slightly different. So th there isn't going to be a single price for Spectrum. Every station in a different place is going to be worth a different thing. Um, and uh, so, so, so it's not, it's not going to be as simple as that. Um, I'll come back to that question, but uh, let, let me talk about externalities. So economic theory says that it's, it's best to uh, define property rights in a way where I don't care um, who wins, you know, what everybody else wins, as long as I know what I win. Um, you, you get really uh, serious problems in market design when that property doesn't hold. And that's called an externality if I care about what other people get. And uh, in the incentive auction, uh, the, the, the way of uh, ensuring this is to say, I, as a TV station, don't care about what happens to all the other TV stations because I get a guarantee about how much harmful interference I'm going to receive. And the way that this uh, is understood by the FCC um, in, in uh, legislation is that uh, no other channel should cause more than minimal interference. And the FCC was given the freedom to interpret what that phrase means. And what they have historically meant, uh, understood it to mean, is uh, that no more than half a percent of the population served by that station faces harmful interference. But even that, what does that quite mean? So if we took that really seriously and tried to, on the fly, computationally verify how much of your population and the service area that you know, your, so I know where your antenna is, and I know where people live in the United States, and I know the propagation characteristics of radio, is affected by you know, hills and buildings and trees. And there's like discrete particle simulations that have been written by the FCC that, that model all of this in a cell-based kind of way. And you can actually figure out for a given assignment of um, stations you know, with signal strengths and tower locations to channels, uh, who's going to be interfered with to what extent and how much population gets interfered with. And uh, given one input like that, verifying that for the entire country takes uh, days of computer time. Um, and turns out, I didn't tell you this before, but there are 2,990 stations uh, that we need to assign to channels, um, which means um, if I was going to assign them, for example, to 29 channels, which is sort of a middling range for the band plans I just showed you, that would give me on the order of 10 to the 4,300 different possible assignments, each of which would take days of computer time to verify. Um, you know, that, that seems like a, a pretty problematic number. To think about. So, um, th this was around the time the FCC started talking to me when they realized that they were getting into this problem. And one of the, the first things we were painfully but ultimately able to persuade them to do was to redefine harmful interference in a way that, that made this, this whole thing much more tractable to think about. So, uh, we, we changed the definition of harmful interference to say that a station suffers minimal interference if no other single station interferes with more than half a percent of its population, rather than aggregate interference. And we argued, based on simulations, that, that this was a pretty good approximation of the first condition most of the time. Um, that's helpful because uh, it's going to take months and years of computer time, but I can offline compute all of these pairwise rules that say, uh, if Yair is on channel 17 and I'm on channel 16, um, you know, am I going to face interference from him or not? I can make all of these pairwise rules for all of the stations in the United States, and then I just know those constraints. And now I can say, let me find some assignment of uh, channels to frequencies that doesn't uh, violate those constraints. Um, it, let me finish the slide, just in case you ask me about the slide. Um, and you, you've already used your, uh, your two free chances. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, as Yair was, was probably just about to point out to us, um, even doing that is a graph coloring problem. It's, it's NP complete. So it, it's nice that I don't have to kind of generate the constraints uh, for every assignment using two days of supercomputer time. But, uh, but I've still got an NP complete problem to reason with. And um, that means, you know, unless as a side effect of working for the FCC, I'm going to prove that P equals NP, uh, I'm going to have to uh, be willing to accept an algorithm that takes exponential time to run in the worst case. Um, and you know, ultimately, what I'm thinking about is a graph with 2,990 nodes and 29 colors. So the, you know, that, that could be pretty bad. Uh, at this point, let me, uh, let me ask Geir if he had something different to, to say. See? All right. Good things come to those who wait. So, uh, so, so here's a bullet for the Chicago economists that I periodically run into. 
Uh, so they say, why shouldn't the market just sort this out? You, know, you don't have to do this in a computer. You should just let people talk to each other and figure it out. And, and this is a point that they have a hard time understanding. But um, if that worked, that would mean that the market corresponds to a, a distributed algorithm that is able to solve NP-complete problems optimally. And as much as we believe in the power of the market, you know, th there are only you know, 2,990 people. So that means I have a, a, a parallel algorithm that takes 2,990 processors and can solve uh, you know, this NP-complete problem. And that, that would be magic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if, uh, if, the, if your laptop cannot find it, then the market will not either. Um, but also, so is this problem really that hard? I mean, the graph, you would imagine, would have like small separators. For example, it's not quite planar or anything. But um, you know, the actual interference graph should have a lot of geographic problems. Oh, now, now that I've shut down the idea, I have, I have somebody new stepping into that role. Uh, so, so that's exactly what the, the second half of the talk is okay. going to be about. So. Um, I wouldn't be here talking to you about this if this was a hopeless uh, endeavor. But, but I will tell you that unsolvable problems, you know, problems that you know, no reasonable amount of computer time would allow us to solve, uh, really do occur in practice. So the, the problem is not uh, provably easy, certainly. Uh, and it's not uh, uh, practically easy all the time. Yeah. It's not a problem you would plug into an IoT solver kind of off the shelf. In, in kind of 10 minutes or something, uh, I, I'll show you what happens if you put it into an ILP solver, and it's not encouraging. Uh, yeah? Just to follow on that line, the question, the more precise question would be that, given this fixed graph instance, how high? <clears throat> uh, that, that's right. So uh, you have fixed the conditions you need and so on. So now the property theory has nothing to say about it. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, ultimately, I'm interested in fixed size input, so I'm not really concerned with asymptotics. So there's there's some hand waving here where I talk about NP completeness. That's true. That that's mostly true. I, I mean, I think I, I think again, I I, I will soon be making a, a point very related to that point. Uh, it's not it's not really quite the case that I care about one graph. I, I'm going to turn out to care about all subgraphs of a given graph, of which there are exponentially many. But 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 it is true that I, I care about a particular. Structure. Let me make sure nobody over here has been trying to raise their hands because I don't see you as well. Don't be shy, guys. Don't, don't let these guys have all the fun. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so here then is the market design that, that we actually propose to use. Um, it's a, a, a heuristic clock auction um, version of, uh, uh, of a way of, alloc of uh, selling and buying spectrum. So here, here's how it works. Uh, there's a forward ascending price auction for telecom firms where we imagine that we somehow um, ended up in one of those band plans that I showed you before. And we say, how much you, would you be willing to pay for this beautiful cleared spectrum that I just told you about? Uh, and and I'm, I'm going to say very little about how this works because this is essentially what the FCC has been doing for a long time. Uh, it's, not, it's not simple, but it's very well understood at this point. If you actually have some clear spectrum, how do you sell it in an ascending clock auction? Um, we didn't really innovate um, especially much in that part of the space. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about the way we bought spectrum from broadcasters, because that had never been done before. And um, there we used a descending price auction, where each station was basically given a, a series of descending offers um, and asked, uh, take it or leave it, whether they were willing to accept those offers. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more on the next slide about how that worked. And then. Uh, so for a given band plan, I would use these two decoupled auctions to figure out um, how much would it cost me to buy up the spectrum that, that I want to buy up, and how much money would I get if I then sold it off to the telecoms. And then I look at those two numbers, and I say, are these compatible with each other? Um, I, I would start with, with, the mo with clearing the most spectrum I could try to clear, and say, is it the case that I make enough money uh, on the, the forward side to actually pay off the guys that I'm buying from on the, uh, on the reverse side. And if it is, if I can um, make enough money, then I stop. Then, uh, and, and in legislation, what they said is we had to make um, one and a half billion dollars. So we had to, uh, to cover the auction's cost and make a, a payment uh, of, I think, a half billion dollars to the national debt. And, and if we could do that much, that was good enough. Um, you know, maybe we're leaving a few billions on the table, but you know, it is the US government. So, um, so, so that, that's good enough. It's a stopping condition. 
And, and after all, we want to clear as much spectrum as we can. And otherwise, um, th there's not a market for that much spectrum. So we're going to shrink the amount of spectrum, restart both of the auctions, keep going a little bit, um, and, and keep iterating until eventually, hopefully, we converge. Um, so let me, let me tell you how this, oh, yeah, sorry, Don, go on. Yes. Um, so uh, I haven't yet um, made claims about the incentive properties of the auction. Um, it turns out that uh, the auction that I'm going to describe is dominant strategy truthful for um, the TV stations. If I assume that each TV station acts independently, um, many of them don't. Uh, many of them are owned by big companies like Comcast. Uh, it also turns out that some hedge funds during this auction were actually trying to buy up sets of TV stations in order to bid collusively. Um, well, so collusion, explicit collusion is illegal under US law. So, so that we have to worry less about because we just put people in jail if we catch them. Um, but implicit collusion in the sense that I own many participants in the market uh, and I just have them behave in a coordinated way uh, isn't illegal because that's not really collusion. That's just sort of being a complicated uh, company. Um, that's something we, we studied a lot. I'm not really going to touch on it in this talk. Uh, it certainly causes problems for the formal incentive guarantees. We tried to argue that, that we weren't worried that it was going to distort the market too severely. Uh, and in some kind of post hoc analysis, we, we believe indeed that it, it wasn't so bad. Uh, but I, I, can't, I can't say anything formal uh, that would guarantee that it wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. Uh, they actually happened sequentially, but sort of logically they happened at the same time. The question was whether the auctions happened at the same time. I just did. The, the, the question was whether the auctions happened at the same time. Uh, and no, they, they happened sequentially, but sort of logically they might as well happen at the same time. I, no, not much. Uh, actually, uh, in legislation, um, no one is allowed to know publicly what happened in the auction, uh, in the reverse auction, for two years after the auction closed. I still don't know what happened. People won't tell me because um, a lot of sensitive information about companies' values for their stations was revealed. And uh, this was really useful information to their competitors. I mean, if somebody actually told me what happened, it's, the truth is I wouldn't care very much. So I, I'm not losing sleep over the fact that I don't know. But, uh, but we're really not allowed to know. Yeah. But that's a really good question. Uh, so he asked, how do we know that if we clear less spectrum, the, the revenue would increase? Uh, what I know is that if I clear less spectrum, the per block of spectrum revenue would increase. Um, but uh, it could be that the global uh, revenue would decrease. Uh, however, um, the, the per spectrum revenue would increase. And I, only, and I have to buy out my spectrum. So I don't really care about having more global revenue. I care about being able to cover my costs. and. Uh, uh, it could be that I would run this thing all the way through, and there's just at none of these band plans uh, do supply and demand meet, and I just end up selling no spectrum. Um, and if that happened, then you know everyone was lying to us about how important it was to reallocate spectrum, and we go home and we say, you know, sorry guys, uh, you keep all your TV stations. Um, that that turns out not to be what happened. So so in the real auction, um, this process iterated four times, and we we stopped the fourth band plan, the fourth biggest band, band plan. Yeah. No, um, the, uh, the, this would have worked very differently if they had done that. Uh, they told everybody they were going to do this exactly once, and you have to really participate this one time. Well, it depends on how much you believe them, but when the US government threatens that they're going to stop doing something and they're going to be seized by gridlock and they'd be unable to ever do something again, you should believe them to some extent, right? Uh, they. Uh, about half the TV stations in the U.S. are going away, as, uh, or about half the TV spectrum in the U.S. is going away as, as a uh, side effect of this exercise. So um, there, there's a lot less of it around than there was before. So uh, if, if they did this every year and, and managed to get rid of half of it every time, they, pretty soon they would, there wouldn't be much left, right? So uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, sure. Um, in the aggregate, modulo the efficiency properties of the auction, and it's a messy thing. But uh, but sure, you get to know that the auction continues, and that that leaks some information about how strong demand was. Um. 
Um, that, that's a good question. I, I'd like to say more about how the, I, I mean, the, the, the short answer is, you know, this is how it worked. Um, there's, uh, there's as much holdout as there is. Um, the, the problem is when, once we kind of combine it with Val's point about collusion, where all of our guarantees break down. So, so if you really think about all of the bidders as being um, holders of single stations, then, then there's no holdout problem, even with this iteration. It, it really is incentive compatible, even when embedded in this repeating auction. Um, once you think of some bidders as holding multiple stations, <laughs> then, then things become complicated and we turn to simulations. Um, OK, so let me tell you how this auction works. Uh, and let me do it uh, using an example of, uh, of something that is a, lo a lot more relatable than Spectrum, because it's really hard to think about Spectrum. So uh, I instead want to use an example um, of airline overbooking, because this is something that is close to all of our hearts. And I should say, yesterday, uh, I was trying to, uh, when I flew here a couple of days ago, I flew on uh, EVA Airlines. And any of you who has flown on EVA Airlines might be aware that some of their airplanes are, are Hello Kitty themed. And they have giant Hello Kitty art on the outside of the airplane. And indeed, inside the airplane, and on your pillows, and on all of the service items they give you. And it was a, a surreal and absurd experience. And so I, I tried to get Hello Kitty pictures to put into this part of the talk, but the bandwidth on the EduRoam network in this room is so slow, it was technically infeasible. So instead, I just have to let you picture Hello Kitty airplanes while we do this. Um, but, uh, but let's consider a, a, a semi-realistic airline overbooking example where we have a constraint that isn't real that says passengers either have to fly in the cabin that they're assigned to, or they're going to be compensated for giving up their seat but they're not able to be uh, upgraded to a different cabin. And um, that's, that's just going to make this correspond to the setting that we care about. That, that says nothing meaningful about airline overbooking. So the feasibility constraint that we're going to care about then is that the number of passengers in a cabin uh, is less than or equal to the number of seats. And I'm going to use the real reverse auction mechanism to set compensations for people in this set. So the way it works is that we start with a Hello Kitty airplane big enough to fit everybody. Uh, so here's a kind of schematic picture of that. I've got my 787 here with some people in first class and some people in business class and some people in economy. And you notice that uh, there are a lot of empty seats. And so like any good airline, EVA Airlines is going to say, you know, hold on, maybe we should fly a 737 instead and save ourselves a whole lot of money. So let's uh, you know, get a smaller plane. Uh, and the problem we now have is that we, we have... Uh, fewer seats than we have people. So, so what do you do? Well, you, you kick some people off the plane. And you know, if you're United Airlines, the way you do it is that you drag somebody off the airplane and you, know, you break their teeth. Um, Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about. But you know, Eva Airline is a very polite airline. And so you know, you, you, maybe you're going to do it with money instead. So, so, so what you do is you say, all right, let's uh, tell you what. Sorry, we, we substituted a smaller plane. But uh, hey, we're going to give you some money. So how about $1,000, uh, and you take the first flight out of Taipei tomorrow. And uh, some people say, you know, that sounds pretty good to me. You know, I'd like to fly on your plane, but I also like money. So uh, sure, I'll take the $1,000. And critically um, important for this to make sense in our auction context, uh, we get to feasibility at this point. So we offer people enough money that, in fact, the people who won't accept our offer um, all fit onto the plane at the same time. If that doesn't work, you have to offer them a bigger amount of money at the beginning. And, uh, and then EVA Airlines says to you, all right, you know, we're a polite airline, but we're still an airline. So you, you have to you expect that this is going to go badly for you. And uh, we were lying. We're not going to give you $1,000. Um, how do you feel about $800? And, and some people say, you know, I've got an important talk to give at NUS tomorrow. You know, I, I'm starting to see where this is going. I'm getting back on the plane. Other people say, you know, OK, fine, $800 is still money. I'll take it. Some people go on the plane. Some people don't. Uh, now look what happened in first class. Um, I now have no more uh, seats available in first class. So what can I do? Um, well, I have three people who accepted $800 offers to go uh, off the plane. And I have nowhere else to put them. And so those people, I'm really going to have to pay $800. Um, but everybody else, I've still got some seats. So to those people, I say, how do you feel about $600? So people go back, $500. So people go back, and now business class uh, is full. And so, so those people have arrived at a price of $500. And notice I've offered a lower price in business class, not because business class is less good than first class, although it surely is, uh, but because um, 
they, uh, anyone who's seen Crazy Rich Asians has had a view of what first class looks like. It looks pretty sweet. But, uh, but it's because uh, the other people in business class were willing to accept lower compensation. And so my market didn't clear until the price got lower. So, so this came from what all of the other people were willing to accept, not, not from the inherent value of the thing, whatever that means. And economy class, you know, anyone who's willing to fly in economy class in the first place must not care about, you know, must care about money a lot, right? So, so these people, I can keep offering them lower prices and you know, a Hello Kitty toothbrush, and they'll, they'll keep uh, just accepting my lower and lower offers until finally I pack them in like sardines at $250, and the, these unlucky guys uh, get stuck in Taipei for the night. So, so that's ultimately how, uh, how the auction works. So I have these, uh, these series of descending offers uh, to buy you out of something. So these people are basically selling me their seat. I'm deciding how much the seat is worth. People are exchangeable because I can put them back into any seat. Uh, and eventually, um, everyone accepts offers. And once a constraint binds that I can't find a feasible solution when I put them back on the plane, I have to pay them the last offer they accepted. Well, from a mathematical perspective, they're different. Uh, it turns out to matter. I mean, here we're selling something, right? So uh, just as ascending auctions make sense uh, when you're buying something, uh, descending auctions make sense when you're selling something. It, it, it's surprisingly hard to put a minus sign in front of things and have them still make sense. I, I've struggled with this myself, so I, I forgive you. But, but yeah, the natural thing to expect in, a, in a, a procurement setting is that you would have a descending auction. That's right. So you have to start with a very high initial price that uh, gives you feasibility. Um, that shouldn't worry you too much because you then get to lower the prices. Um, it, you know, unless a constraint binds right at the beginning, and then you're going to have to pay somebody a ridiculous amount. Um, that, that's really a feature of the auction. Yeah. It's just a plot of bids. I guess I don't see why you couldn't just afford. Maybe you just, you know, you have over capacity. You don't have enough bids. And you start offering more and more and more money for them to come off. Which is how they actually do it. Uh, the, the problem is the incentive guarantee. So uh, th that's not going to be dominant strategy, truthful. So the, the property that we want here is um, think about the strategic problem that you face. I'm not going to kind of prove the theorem to you, but it, it's really easy to prove the theorem in your head that this is dominant strategy, truthful. Because at any given time, I come to you and I make an offer. I say, you know, I'm offering you $800. Is it worth $800 to you? You have some real value of what you would be willing to pay to go off the plane. Uh, let's say it's really worth $550 to you. I, I offer you $800, and I say, if you take this, uh, one of two things is going to happen. You know, either I'm going to pay you $800, or I'll come back to you with another offer, and I'll let you decide again. If you turn this down, you're on the plane forever, and there's nothing further you can do to affect the auction. That's dominant strategy truthful for you, to, to accept the offer uh, if and only if your true value is, uh, is less than $800. Um, it, it turns out the incentive analysis on the ascending function is much messier. It's not going to give you dominant strategies. Um, OK, so, uh, so, so this is kind of what happened in the real auction, except these different classes of service aren't kind of better and worse stations. They're stations in different parts of the country. So think of you know, New York, LA, and the Midwest. And again, you know, licenses are going to turn out to be expensive in New York relative to the Midwest, not because New York is better. Uh, but because other stations are willing to pay, uh, demand higher prices, uh, you know, they're going to go back on the air at higher prices in New York uh, because they can make more money servicing customers in New York because it's a dense place. Um, however, the constraints that I showed, the uniform Metroid constraint that I just gave you that said number of passengers is less than or equal to number of seats, is a wild oversimplification of what happens in the real auction. So this is a, a graph of the actual constraints in the auction. Uh, which, as you can see, is, uh, is pretty hard to resolve uh, just by looking at it. But you can see the country is, is pretty connected. Uh, and in particular, um, the eastern seaboard is ridiculously connected. So uh, there are nodes in uh, New York that have a uh, degree of 130. So there are stations that affect 130 other stations directly. So really, really highly uh, constrained uh, graph here. And, and what that means is that uh, this uh, this situation where somebody's constraints bind and I have to then pay them uh, can happen to really nearby stations at very different times, depending on the connectivity of the constraint graph. So here's the part where we transition uh, to the second part of the talk. Um, 
I, I think almost exactly 45 minutes in, but maybe we're, we're going to try to end uh, not, not the full 90 minutes along. I guess we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, the, uh, so, so this test to decide whether I have to freeze somebody's price and stop making them descending offers uh, is going to be uh, one where I have to check whether the constraints bind. I, I basically have to say, I've got all of these people who've gotten back on the plane, which is to say stations that have decided they're not going to sell me their spectrum and they're going to remain TV stations. Um, and I've got you. You're, you're currently off the air. You know, you're currently told me you've accepted a previous offer to go off the air. And I wanted to set, decide whether I can lower your price and make you a new lower offer. And in order to do that, I've got to first make sure that there's room for you on the plane. I've got to make sure that if you turn down my offer, I can stick you back on the air. Because after all, that's what I just threatened you. That I, I said the reason we have dominant strategies is that when I make you an offer, you can always turn it down. Uh, if it turned out there's really nowhere to put you because the constraints bind, then I'm not allowed to make you another offer. Uh, and because everything is so asymmetric here, I really have to go round robin through all the stations. And every time I face a new station, I have to say, is it the case that with everybody else who's currently on the air and you, there's some way of assigning channels to everybody that's actually going to respect the interference constraints? And that means I need to solve a graph coloring problem every time any individual station faces a price movement, which is on the order of about 100,000 times per auction. So I need to solve about 100,000 different graph coloring problems to run one auction. Um, the, uh, so that's what I meant to you before about there, there being many different graphs. It's going to be the graph induced by the set of nodes that are currently on the air plus each one of the nodes that is currently off the air. Um, and um, turns out that about 80% of those problems are trivial. Um, how, how am I defining trivial? What I mean is I can take the previous assignment that worked for those stations that are all off the air. I can just fix them, oh, sorry, on the air. I, I can fix them. I can take this one guy, and, I, and without changing anything about the assignment to these guys, I can just find something that works for him and verify uh, you know, really straightforwardly that, that everything is fine. So about 80% of the time, uh, this thing is trivial. Just kind of a greedy algorithm gets me there, and I'm, I'm done. But about 20% of the time, um, that's not enough. Uh, I'm not going to be able to figure out whether this thing works or not. Um, and, and so what I'm going to do is turn to kind of a heuristic optimization kinds of approaches to try to figure out something better there. Um, as I said before, I've got uh, up to 2,990 nodes in my graph, uh, depending on who wants to go on the air, who wants to go off the air. Um, I didn't tell you this before, but it, it turns out I have 2.7 million interference constraints. And by the way, the FCC made this part of the data public, so you can actually go download this if you want to play with it. And um, the phrase the FCC lawyers allowed me to use in a talk is that there was initial skepticism about whether this problem could be solved at a national scale. Um, <laughs> They, uh, they, they won't allow me to say what they were doing before I started working with them, but, but it was not seeking exact solutions at a national scale. Um, and uh, basically, we built something that works almost all of the time at a national scale um, using an approach that, that I'll uh, call deep optimization I'll, in a somewhat tongue-in-cheek way. And I'll tell you on the next slide why, uh, why I think that name makes some kind of sense before yeah, you're asking me about it. You know, as a proud Canadian patriot, I'm glad that you recognize that Canada and the United States are, in fact, different countries. Uh, it's a minority point of view. Um, but, uh, but yeah, actually, th this was one of the things that made this thing really messy. About halfway through my work on this project, I got a phone call from the FCC, and they said, we didn't tell you this before, but we've been actually been in backroom treaty negotiations with Canada this entire time. Um, Canada was a real thorn in our side for the auction because the entire Canadian population lives across, along the U.S. border. Basically, 95% of the Canadian population lives within 50 miles of the U.S. border. And radio signals do not respect the border. They, you know, they don't have a, a Faraday cage, uh, you know, a, a big and beautiful <laughs> concrete Faraday cage on the Canadian-U.S. border. And so the, the effect of that is that uh, there's a treaty that basically says, um, you know, every you know, Canadian station is protected from interference by U.S. stations on the particular frequency they're currently broadcasting at. And in fact, not every Canadian station, but a gigantic number of hypothetical Canadian stations that could in the future exist but never have. 
Uh, and so this means we had really binding constraints along the Canadian border because there's a lot of population in the US side right there. And it really was uh, you know, crimping our stuff in terms of what we could do. So it would have been really nice to repack the Canadian spectrum at the same time. And it would have been really good for Canada because then Canada would have the, so, so Canada wasn't going to sell off the spectrum. But basically, the US government could just shuffle around Canadian stations, create a big contiguous uh, 600 megahertz block for Canada, and the Canadian government would then be free to sell it off later. It would be good for everybody. So they eventually did um, arrive at a deal to do this. And so the, the effect was that on the reverse auction side, we actually repacked all Canadian spectrum as well. Um, but on the, on the forward side, we didn't sell it. Actually, that, the sale is happening right now. So that, that auction in Canada is, is currently underway. Well, the, the problem is the TV towers. So the TV towers are all wherever they are. And uh, so, so that's what we're buying out here. Uh, the, the cell side, just many things about, you know, surprisingly enough, radio spectrum use, you know, is a lot less insane in 2018 than it was in the 60s. So uh, everything works a lot better on the cell side in terms of interference. But, but the TV channels are, you know, this crazy analog thing that just shouts really loud from someplace. Uh, and and that, that's the much bigger problem. Uh, there's a question over here. I'm excited to hear from this side of the room. Uh, so the constraints are basically that there's one constraint for each edge. Uh, th there's one constraint for each edge, and actually even a little bit more. So um, it, it turns out there's one constraint for each edge for every pair of colors for which there could be interference. So remembering what uh, these guys over here were mentioning before, these guys obviously know something about telecommunications. Uh, because propagation characteristics are slightly different for different frequencies. It actually turns out, you know, you and I might interfere if I'm on channel 29 and you're on channel 28, but we might not interfere if I'm on channel 12 and you're on channel 13, because the propagation of those, uh, those radio frequencies are a little bit different. And so crazy radio engineers at the FCC actually worked all of this out for us, and they told us, you know, you only have to worry about this interference, you know, on these frequencies, but not on those frequencies. It's actually kind of a graph coloring problem where the constraints depend on which colors people get. Um, so so that, that, that gives us a bit more, um, a lot more constraints to think about than we would have had if it was um, independent. Uh, I think there was a hand over here, but maybe you sorted yourself out. Yeah. Yeah, they actually do have a Faraday cage on the Mexican border, so it's fine. Uh, no, no, they don't. But. Uh, Anyone who's following American politics right now should have thought that that was a joke, but, but maybe, maybe humor is dead in 2019. Um, there isn't a treaty, actually. Uh, they just couldn't work it out. I don't, I don't know whether they tried. And the, the truth is there's a lot more population like really densely along the edge of the Canadian border than there is right along the edge of the Mexican border, so it's a bit less of an issue in the optimization. Uh, they still have a treaty, so we still had to respect the... Um, the Mexican stations along the border, but um, we didn't repack them. So they don't show up as nodes in the graph. They, they rather show up kind of in the constraints of what's, what's allowable for those stations. Um, OK, so um, let, let me tell you something, sort of a bit of a sidebar, but, but it's important and it's cool. And if you're a, uh, a person who thinks about uh, algorithmic game theory, I think this is something really worth knowing. Um, Something was really different about this um, auction design than any auction that I'm aware of before. So, so this is a combinatorial auction in the sense that you're um, simultaneously trading many, many goods all at the same time. And you're doing it via solving an NP-complete problem to think about uh, allocation. And if you were going to use VCG to do this, you would have to globally decide what is the social welfare maximizing uh, allocation to fit everybody into the band plan kind of all at once for the entire country. Um, we tried to do that um, using the fastest computers we had, um, using the best MIP solvers, giving them about uh, two or three weeks of computer time. We couldn't solve the first optimization problem. I just never returned. Um, and, and with VCG, if you can't solve the optimization problem, you're just hosed. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't approximate. So uh, all the incentive guarantees break down completely if, uh, if you are only able to solve the problem approximately. Um, this problem is cool because it decomposes. Because um, I'm not solving one gigantic optimization problem for the entire thing. I'm solving little micro optimization problems for every price movement. And let's think about what happens if one of those optimization problems fails to solve. So let's say I'm trying to decide whether I can lower the price for Val. And you know, I grind away on my computers. 
turns out, you know, for whatever crazy reason about the, the topology of the constraint graph, you know, I'm just not able to solve her problem. Um, in fact, that does happen. Um, then what can I do? Well, if I, tell, if I just say, I'm going to cross my fingers and go for it and just offer her a lower price, terrible, terrible things could happen. Because it might be that really there was no room on the plane. And she says, no, I want to get back on the plane. And then I have a lawsuit on my hands. And you know, I get fired by the FCC. And agents show up in my house. So, so we can't do that. But let's see what happens if I just tell her, sorry, I'm going to have to freeze your price. There's no room for you on the plane. Well, if there was room on the plane, then I'm potentially paying her too much. But so what? I'm paying her a little bit too much. Nothing bad happens to the incentive guarantees. Um, the contract I made with her that either one of her offers is going to be accepted or I'll give her a subsequent offer to, to make up her mind is respected. And I just maybe paid a little bit too much. Um, that's a really cool property for this auction to have. Because if I'm able to solve most but not all of these optimization problems, my incentive guarantees work out fine. Uh, and my revenue degrades a little bit. And it's a little harder to think about efficiency, but you might expect that efficiency degrades a little bit as well. I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that at the very end of the talk. Um, so so that, that's a pretty cool thing. I think this is a, a neat way forward for thinking about algorithmic uh, game theory in these kind of combinatorial settings where we use heuristic algorithms, because we can kind of provably tolerate degradation in our ability to solve the problem. So, so our, our goal was to build a feasibility tester that would work as well as possible for the FCC. It didn't have to work 100% of the time, but we wanted to get as close to 100% as possible. And they kind of told me, like, Kevin, stop caring so much about 100%. I really, really wanted to get to 100%. We didn't quite get there, but we got, as you'll see, very close. Um, so uh, as was pointed out already by some of you here, we only care about the actual graph that we've got. We don't want to build something that would work for the constraint graph of China. We know where all the TV stations are in the United States and how they interfere with each other. We want to build a custom algorithm that will work for this one purpose. Um, and so to do that, and also we also know um, something about the valuations of the stations. We know that a station's value is, is at least proportional to the population that it serves. And we know where everybody lives. So we have a valuation model that's not perfect, but that's decent. And that tells us when the exits are likely to happen in the auction. So, so we built, uh, an, a, the FCC initially built an auction simulator. And we were able to get tons and tons of, of the problems that would arise in simulations under various assumptions about collusion, about what the valuations might be, about what the clearing target would turn out to be. And we generated tons and tons of data. Um, and we built this thing uh, by studying that data. And the FCC promised me that I could publish on that data. And then later on, they, they said, you know, we promised you that, but we really would like it if you didn't publish on that data. And that made me very, very sad. Um, but I wanted to be nice to them. So, so then Neil, my hard suffering graduate student, who is going to start to feature more strongly in the narrative of this talk, um, had to go build an entire auction simulator. Um, and we used it to gather entirely new data from his simulator, uh, which is the data that I will present on here. So that data used an 84 megahertz clearing target, which is the clearing target that eventually the auction had in the final round. Um, it generated models by sampling from a publicly available model that was published about this exact auction. Um, we made the assumption that stations participated when their private value for continuing to broadcast was um, smaller than um, their opening offer. So we just basically said, you, you'll participate if somebody makes you an offer that would make you money. And we gave the feasibility checker, the, the graph coloring algorithm that we were building, which incidentally we called SATFC, um, a one minute timeout for each problem. One minute might seem pretty low to you, uh, but we have to solve these problems sequentially. So basically, if I've got 2,990 stations and one round of price movements means I have to sequentially solve 2,990 stations. Why sequentially? Because I first of all have to decide whether I'm going to make a lower offer to you. Then I need to find out whether you accept my offer. If you reject my offer, you go back on the plane. And that changes the problem for everyone downstream of you. Um, and you might think, oh, you can do some speculative execution. And you can, but only a little bit deep before you, something actually happens. So, um, so, so we should model this just as happening uh, sequentially. Um, we, we, uh, for this data that I'll show you here, we generated 20 um, simulated auctions, which produced about 60,000 problem instances. And uh, I'll get to you in a second, Fahim. Um, and uh, those uh, instances were mostly uh, trivial, as I told you before. Uh, the previous numbers I gave you from the FCC's data, which had slightly different assumptions. Um, but, um, but here, 
um, we kept only those problems which were, um, were non-trivial in the sense that I mentioned before. So all of my graphs that I'll show you will be for those non-trivial problems that, that we actually need to run the solver on. Uh, Fahim? Is this ordering in this sequential evaluation making it? We're currently doing a kind of post hoc analysis paper to try to understand elements of the auction design and which of them matter and which don't. There's so many moving pieces that it's hard to be definitive without really doing exhaustive experiments about everything. And every experiment takes kind of weeks to generate one data point. Uh, we believe it doesn't make much of a difference, but, um, but it's hard to be definitive. Yeah? Did you solve the problem from scratch each time you had to change the data? More to say about that coming up. Uh, indeed, you might think that, uh, that you wouldn't want to, right? Wouldn't. I mean, yeah. you, you might think, I already know something about how I could repack people. Now, I've got a non-trivial instance, so I know I can't augment that solution trivially, but maybe I can use that information for something. Dynamic, I mean, I work in dynamic data structures. Well, then stay tuned. There'll be lots of exciting stuff for you. Um, OK, so, um, so, so the, the first thing that I promised Yair um, some time ago was, what if I just threw MIP solvers at this? That, that seems like uh, that's indeed the kind of thing the FCC was talking to themselves about before I showed up. That seems like the off-the-shelf natural thing that you would do here. Um, so let me show you a graph of what happens. I, I'm not allowed to show you what the FCC actually did, but I can show you off-the-shelf CPLEX and Garobi, which is not a bad placeholder for what they were doing. Um, and uh, let me explain what this picture means. So um, in the future, I'm going to be making choices about the algorithm based on data. And let me assure you that I did a, an appropriate training test data split. I'm not going to say too much about it, but all of the data make decisions about the algorithm is not data that I'm using to evaluate the algorithm here. This is all test data. Um, what am I showing you here? This is uh, my data set of non-trivial instances kind of all jumbled together without regard for where they occurred in the auction. Um, this is 0% of my data. This is 100% of my data. And this is amount of time on a log scale. And so I'm showing you an empirical cumulative density function here that says, at each point in time, how much of my data have I solved within that amount of time? So I'm saying, that within a uh, runtime of one second, uh, and I'm using CPLEX, I can solve about 5% of my problems. And this dotted line is my one minute cutoff. And within one minute, you see that uh, CPLEX is able to solve about 15% uh, of my problems. And Garobi is able to solve a little bit more than a third of my problems. Um, so, so that's what, where you get if you use these off the shelf MIP solvers. Um, now, you might ask, you know, how, how good is enough? Uh, it's a little hard to know, but th this is pretty bad, right? We're, we're solving almost none of the non-trivial, you know, a minority of the non-trivial instances with MIP. Uh, that's certainly not good enough to use in the real auction. Uh, so this was kind of our starting point. MIP was not going to work. So, so the first thing that I said to the FCC is, you know, I, I happen to have worked on SAT quite a, long before, a lot before. And uh, you know, I don't want to uh, just go back to the, the well where I've drunk before. But this really looks a lot more like a SAT problem than like a MIP problem. Because you don't have an objective function. There's nothing you're trying to maximize here. And you don't have any real values at all in the constraints. It's a purely combinatorial problem. And that's what SAT is really great for. And you know, SAT has really powerful solvers. And the FCC said, you know, what's SAT? We've never heard of SAT before. Uh, so the FCC thought I was the guy who invented SAT, which was, was great. I was really happy to, to be the guy who invented SAT. Um, so the SAT community has these SAT competitions where they uh, lots of different groups around the world make these amazing new SAT solvers, and, and it's all open source, it's all out there. So we could just take like every SAT solver in the world and run it on this data and see what happened. And there's dozens and dozens of them. And so let me show you the, the best performing SAT solvers. There's too many SAT solvers to fit on a graph, so I'll show you the best ones. Uh, and here's how they do. And uh, I left CPLEX and Garobi as dotted lines here just for comparison. And you see the SAT solvers are doing a whole lot better than, uh, than the MIP solvers. So this instinct to think that maybe SAT was going to be a good idea uh, seems to be generally pretty borne out. Um, you know, the, best, uh, the best solvers here uh, are actually local search solvers. So G Novelty Plus uh, PCL here is a, a local search solver. These are sorted in order of how well they do in the, the last round. Um, some of them are clearly better than others. You know, G, G Novelty Plus gets up to about 80%. Um, you know, your eye might be caught by Satinstein here, which is actually a solver that my group wrote. Uh, hooray, guys. You know, so we seem to uh, do decently well within a minute, and then we just stagnate completely. We, we don't solve anything you know, in, 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 a, in a minute that we don't solve in a second. So that's, that's sort of sad. Uh, but, but generally speaking, you see that it, you know, it looks like there might be a lot, um, 
more hope uh, on the sat side of the fence than on the, uh, the MIP side of the fence. Um, but you know, I, I wanted a whole lot more than 80%. I, I think that you know, that still means that uh, when I'm facing a non-trivial instance uh, and I have to decide whether to make somebody a, pri a, a declining price offer, for, you know, one time out of five, I'm going to freeze somebody's price when I could have lowered it. Um, Fair enough, but the, the prices start out in the millions of dollars. So even freezing one instance can mean, and they, they fall geometrically. So, so failing to make a dec yeah, single declining price movement can be you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars. So uh, the FCC didn't care so much. They, they were more concerned about efficiency, but it still sort of broke my heart to think about leaving this money on the table. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you at the very end what difference this actually made in the auction. And the answer is it, it really does make a difference. Um, although that, that was not at all clear to us when we were working on this, but it, it turns out to be true. Um, now, now, something you might wonder, um, oh, it's interesting the purple one goes away, but um, some, something you might wonder is maybe the ones you can't solve are unsatisfiable. Uh, if I prove unsatisfiability, that's actually in the auction exactly the same thing as timing out, except it's a little bit less reassuring. I don't know that, that I didn't leave money on the table, but if I just fail to solve every unsatisfiable problem, Nothing at all changes about the world. That, that's absolutely fine. So, so you might wonder, are these unsolvable problems just all unsat, in which case it doesn't matter that I can't solve them, or are they satisfiable? Well, I can look at the problems that I do solve, and I'm going to mark satisfiable problems. I just have here a, a, a histogram um, showing how many of them were, were satisfiable and how many were unsatisfiable. The sat ones are blue, the unsat ones are red, and the unsolvable ones are gray. And you can see little bits of red here. There are unsatisfiable problems, but there aren't very many. And the reason is once somebody's price gets frozen, I never use them in, a, in, the, in any subsequent problems. And all the people who are satisfiably repackable get carried around. So, um, so this tends to produce, it, it appears, almost entirely satisfiable problems, which gave us reason to think, um, later borne out, that most of these problems are, are satisfiable too, which means if I fail to solve them, I really would be leaving money on the table. Um, so, so here's a slide where I'm going to I'm not, not really disagree, but reach a different uh, conclusion than a, the a speaker from yesterday. But before that, let me get to a question here. Uh, they varied substantially. They, they got pretty enormous. Uh, they got up to, uh, I don't know, tens of megabytes big in, uh, in uh, IMAX format. So um, maybe it's been a long time since I've, I've remembered that number. I don't want to say it wrong, but I think tens of thousands of, uh, of clauses and uh, thousands of variables. Um, so uh, so, so uh, you know, I'm an AI person, and this is the obligatory Moore's Law graph. Uh, actually, uh, Edge of Rome was, was good enough yesterday that I was able, uh, in response to yesterday's talk, to get an updated Moore's Law picture. So this is a Moore's Law picture that goes up to 2018. Um, and, uh, and what this shows is, uh, you know, you all know what Moore's Law is. Why am I telling you about it? Uh, it's really important to the story of what AI is doing in 2018. Uh, because, you know, here is um, single thread performance and here's uh, clock frequency. And, you know, clock frequency has basically stagnated since about 2005. And single thread performance hasn't much improved since 2005. And, you know, that's our lived experience of computing. That's, that's the computer sitting on your lap. Um, you know, take it off your lap. It gets too hot. Put it on the table. But, um, but you know, that computer hasn't really gotten faster for a long time. And, and that makes us feel like Moore's Law died a lot sooner than it did. But it's important to remember that the, the number of transistors on a chip has just been marching on over that whole time. Maybe Moore's Law is soon to die, but it hasn't died yet. And um, you know, what have those transistors turned out to be used for? Um, you know, massive increases in the number of logical cores per chip. And, and what that means is we have way more computing power available to us in 2018 than we had in 2005. And many of our intuitions about what it makes sense to do algorithmically haven't changed very much since 2005. Um, some of you were probably uh, you know, eat, not yet eating solid food in 2005, but, but for many of us, uh, you know, we we're pretty set in our ways and we're, we're thinking this, the same things now that, uh, that we were thinking back then. And that's really a mistake because computers are massively more powerful. And that's basically the story of deep learning. So, so let's think about uh, how thinking about um, learning algorithms has changed between uh, um, you know, the olden days and now. 
you know, it used to be that you would you'd come up with features based on expert insight. You'd go to NIPS and hear about which model family everybody likes best this year, and you'd carefully use that. You tune your hyperparameters by hand, and you, you build your, your learner. And you know, basically what deep learning says is, let's have wildly parameterized models. Let's rely on expert knowledge, almost not at all, just to think about you know, which invariances and model biases are, are, are kind of useful. Let's make these models deep in the sense that they have many layers of nodes, each of which depend on the last. So they're very uh, they're deeply hierarchical. And then how would you fit this terrible contraption? Basically, you, know, you don't have anything intelligent to say about that. You bite the bullet. You, you take a ton of data, plus some ideas about regularization to avoid overfitting. And then you optimize this thing just by not caring about how terrible that whole process is. You just rely on the fact that computers have gotten way faster than they used to be, and, uh, and you just grind it out. And uh, it turns out that that, that has uh, turned out to work really well now that computers are so tremendously fast. Uh, there hasn't really been a corresponding revolution in the design of heuristic optimization algorithms. And I want to argue that finding an optimization algorithm that works well in a data set is fundamentally a machine learning problem that is ripe for the same kind of disruption. So the classical approach to building a heuristic optimization algorithm is to say, um, you know, take your data set, use expert knowledge to understand which heuristics are going to work well for your problem, and then iteratively improve it by conducting little experiments, seeing what works, and kind of stay in this iterative improvement loop until the AAAI deadline comes along. And then whatever you've got, submit that, and that's your paper. Um, you know, I think that's sad. I think that, that is uh, limited in the same way that the classical approach to machine learning is limited. And so uh, for a long time, I've been thinking about um, using computers to, to basically automate this um, search over the space of heuristic algorithms. So I, I want to start with a very highly parameterized algorithm that express a combinatorial space of heuristic design choices that I could make, um, all of which kind of make some sense to me, maybe, as heuristics that you would use. And I want these design spaces to be deep in the sense that they have parameter choices about how the algorithm works that conditionally depend on previous parameter choices and conditionally depend on those choices and that are you know, layered many le levels deep in that sense. Maybe in the spaces we worked in, maybe four or five or six levels deep. Um, I want to use lots of data to characterize the distribution of problems that I care about getting good performance on. And then I want to do a computationally intensive search for algorithm designs in that space that work well on the particular problems that I care about getting good average case performance on. Um, how do I actually do this? Um, we've, uh, over the past kind of 15 or 20 years, been designing a family of algorithms that we call algorithm configuration algorithms. So these are meta algorithms in the sense that they take other algorithms as input. So they basically repeatedly probe uh, you can think of them as sort of um, automatic uh, frameworks for experimental design. So they, they repeatedly run algorithms with different inputs, uh, measure what happens, and then decide what to do next and sort of solve the active learning problem. Uh, in particular, um, here I'll talk about an algorithm we designed called um, Sequential Model-Based Algorithm Configuration, or SMAC. Um, which uh, is a Bayesian optimization algorithm that uses machine learning to build a response surface model in parameter space to decide which parameters look promising, and then queries that model to decide what to evaluate next. And either it finds something good that's consistent with what the model predicted, or it finds something that disagrees with the model, and then it updates the model. And so it has this kind of optimism in the face of uncertainty that we're used to in kind of bandits models. Um, if I had more time, I would tell you how this works. I mean, it's a you know, long, really like multi-decade procedure to eventually produce these algorithm configuration models. But, uh, but no, I'm just going to assert that these things exist. Um, so having, uh, having, having built such things, uh, so Yair just told me that even though we started 10 minutes late, we're going to end on time. Um, I, will, I, I will attempt to, to do so. Uh, we're actually not, not so far from the end of the story. Um, maybe not five minutes. Um, the, uh, when we configure all of the solvers that I just told you about before, uh, indeed, uh, on the, the problems we care about, you know, training on training data to be sure we don't overfit, which is indeed a problem here, uh, testing on test data, my best configured solver does much better than the best solver that I had before. Uh, and indeed, you know, Satinstein, this solver that I made fun of that was made by my group, uh, turns out to be our best configured solver. 
uh, because it, it turns out Sadenstein was not designed to be a good algorithm out of the box. Uh, the reason my group designed this is we wanted to build a solver that was basically the convex hull of every idea from local search SAT solvers that had ever been published in the literature. So it's really a highly parameterized space of algorithms that is meant to be used with this kind of algorithm configuration methodology. And indeed, once we configured it for this domain, it turns out it worked really well. Um, so we it got up above 90%. Then we started thinking, uh, and uh, in the interest of time, maybe at this point I'll take questions at the end so that I, I do get to the end of the story. Um, then we started thinking about kind of what Val was asking about before, various ways that we can respect the problem structure of, of the exact uh, you know, FCC domain. Um, one thing we can ask about is whether it's feasible to add, a, uh, you know, we're always asking, uh, is it feasible to add, add a station to a solution that I previously knew was feasible? So that previous solution might be really useful to me. Particularly for local search algorithms, I can initialize them uh, to a starting point of the previously feasible solution or some augmentation of it, and that may put them in a really useful part of the space. Uh, there are various ways that I can do this. Um, our approach was to take every such sensible way and expose it as yet more algorithm-independent parameters of our algorithm. So we, just, we took all of the good ideas we could think about about how this kind of initialization might work, and we exposed them as yet more parameters that we could then optimize over. Um, there's another idea that's very close to my heart. I think it's the theoretically deepest thing that we did here. Uh, I don't have time to tell you about it, um, but it's a, a new kind of caching scheme that we invented here that basically says, how can I remember something about a solution to a previous problem that I can reuse to provably conclude something about a new problem? Um, the, the problem is I, I never really ever see the same problem twice. You might think I would. You know, we looked at really large numbers of simulations, and the same problems just never come up. The, the space is too big. Um, but there are kind of combinatorially useful substructures that we can identify that do repeatedly come up. And this new caching scheme is a way of, first of all, identifying such substructures, um, proving that, that they tell us something about the solution to a new problem, and doing all of this quickly enough that, that the, the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, so I'm happy to tell you about that offline if you're curious. Uh, it might also make sense to think about decomposing the constraint graph. Maybe the induced constraint graph breaks into segments. Maybe identifying those segments and solving them separately is useful. Or maybe it takes more time than it's worth and the SAT solvers are good enough anyway and it's not useful. So we want to identify that as a parameter. Um, and also it turns out some stations are under constrained in the sense that once I set values for everybody else, uh, there's always some way of setting that station, and so it doesn't matter. I don't really have to search over its values. Uh, maybe it's worth identifying those stations. Uh, and so we have a parameter for various different ways that we could do that that are, um, each of them is incomplete but sound and, and stronger and stronger but takes more computational time. Um, and we have parameters about whether all of these things are good. Um, so, so all of this led us to kind of a giant parameter space about all of these different designs. Um, so. So we, we now kind of effectively have an algorithm with a large and deep parameter space that says uh, all of these problem-specific parameters that I just told you about before, plus all of the parameter specific, the algorithm-specific parameters, each of these algorithms uh, exposes sort of tens to hundreds of different parameters about how the algorithm itself works, uh, which themselves are, uh, are deep and conditional, especially for Satinstein, which I told you about before. Um, we chose to... Um, expose two different algorithms uh, for use in our setting. One complete solver that can prove unsatisfiability and one local search solver that can't. Uh, the complete solver we used is called CLASP. It's by a, a group in Germany led by uh, Torsten Schaub. Um, and it, it uh, again was sort of designed for this deep optimization approach of uh, exposing many, many heuristic choices as parameters and allowing them to be set at runtime. Um, so it was really suitable for our, our purposes. Um, and, and we use this Satinstein solver that I, I briefly mentioned to you uh, as our incomplete solver. So those were our choices uh, of solver. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, all of the problem-specific speedups I just listed to you were also parameters that we exposed. Um, and also some other generic speedups I didn't mention that, that weren't specific to the FCC's problem, like um, uh, constrained inference uh, propagation kinds of techniques like AC3, um, and choices over how we actually encode the problem with the SAT. It turns out there are multiple SAT encodings we could think about, and so we actually had parameters that also said, how do we encode? Um, all of this basically gives us some you know, enormous space to design our heuristic algorithm, except that, in fact, we didn't feel like one heuristic algorithm was enough. 
So we actually um, wanted to build a portfolio of many heuristic algorithms. So um, Yair, when he was introducing me, mentioned this idea of Sadzilla. This is a, a graphical depiction of how Sadzilla works. And uh, <laughs> basically, uh, the idea of Sadzilla was let's have many different SAT solvers. Um, let's uh, use machine learning to predict which SAT solver is going to work best at runtime on a new instance I've never seen before. Let me run only that SAT solver and, uh, and have that compete with all of these different, you know, these are just other people's SAT solvers, have them compete in SAT competitions. Turns out that idea does spectacularly well and, and won many SAT competitions until basically the organizers of SAT competitions changed the rules so we were no longer allowed to enter because we were winning too much. Um, <laughs> which made me sad, but I think they might have had a point. Uh, let me just leave questions to the end, sorry. Um, for this particular application, we didn't care so much about computer time, so we just ran everything in parallel. And just whichever thing finished first was, uh, w w was the one that we used. Uh, so let's say that I want to have k algorithms running in parallel. Uh, each of them is going to be some point in the crazy, enormous parameter space that I just described to you. How should I come up with k points in that parameter space that are going to be complementary to each other, that are going to jointly uh, work well to uh, have the fastest one of them solve as many instances as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, we have another method that we call Hydra uh, that is uh, an approach to solving that problem. And it basically um, capitalizes on the fact that this is a submodular optimization problem, that I get um, diminishing returns from adding each um, subsequent solver to a portfolio. Um, and uh, it basically says, let me take my existing algorithm configuration method, uh, SMAC or whatever I have, and let me change its objective function. So instead of saying, find something with the best average runtime, I say, find something that makes the biggest marginal improvement over the given portfolio that I already have. And then I just iteratively add one thing at a time to the portfolio, changing the objective function each time. And I kind of greedily build up a portfolio. And we know for submodular uh, optimization problems like this that, that greedy is a good approximation to the, the global optimum. So this finds something pretty good. Um, so in this way, um, one at a time building up uh, new SAT solvers, we ended up building a solver of eight different configurations from our enormous configuration space. Uh, here's what it produced. Uh, I don't expect you to read and deeply understand this, but, but I just want you to notice that you know, sometimes we picked Satinstein and sometimes we picked CLASP. Sometimes we pick certain problem-specific speedups, and sometimes we pick other ones. So we really just, in this way, built up a diverse set of different uh, SAT solvers that, that worked well together. And putting it all together, here's what we found. Um, so we ended up with uh, our portfolio, which was this gray line, uh, which was close to the performance of the uh, single best thing, but a little bit better. And uh, you know, every little bit makes a difference when you're talking about millions of dollars. So in the end, we, we got to something that on our simulated data, which I don't claim is exactly the same as the real data the FCC faced, we were able to so In fact, we think this is uh, considerably harder data. Um, we were able to solve 96% of our problems. Uh, we don't think we were able to solve 100% of, of the FCC's problems, but we think we were probably more like 98, 99 for them. Um, so, and indeed, um, I, I mentioned before, uh, we think most of these problems were satisfiable. That's kind of borne out by looking at the histogram here. Indeed, most of the problems were satisfiable. So uh, I know I'm nearly uh, at the end of my time. Um, I want to say one more thing before I conclude, which is how much of a difference does this actually make uh, to the economic outcomes? Right? I, I did a kind of bait and switch on you, where I started out by talking about economic market design and the you know, efficiency and revenue and the kinds of things you might care about. And then I kind of switched to saying, let's solve all of these problems. Wouldn't it be cool if I could get to 100%? But what do those two objectives really have to do with each other? I mean, does it really matter to get to 100%? Or you know, would I have done pretty much the same at you know, 60%? Um, that, that's something you can't actually study until you have something that can do 100%, which we, we now almost do. Um, so now we really wanted to come back and sort of study the problem economically. Um, th there are two different categories of comparisons we could make. Um, one is a comparison to VCG, and the other is just looking at the actual auction we ran and, and comparing different strengths of feasibility checkers. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into detail in the time that I have on the uh, VCG comparison, except to say the comparison is a little bit unsatisfying because you can't actually run VCG on the real problem. It's just so hard a combinatorial problem that you can't do it. So we made a toy problem out of real data by saying, let's take every station which is within two hops in the constraint graph from New York City. 
Um, that was a, a problem with 218 stations rather than 2,990 stations. And that was pretty much the biggest thing we could solve using uh, the, the global MIP. That's a much, much smaller problem. I can't guarantee to you that this especially generalizes to the much bigger problems, but this is all we could solve with VCG. Um, and uh, you know, basically when we look there, what we see is um, you know, that we do pretty well in terms of efficiency, but we lose some efficiency uh, and we do better in terms of revenue. Uh, but this is a kind of a small toy problem and I don't have time to go through it in detail. So uh, instead I'd like to show you this picture which says what happens on the real national data using realistic valuations when I just strengthen the feasibility checker. And uh, here I don't have ground truth about what's the very best efficiency you could get, which would come from VCG because I just can't run VCG. But I can make relative comparisons. So here instead of normalizing by the VCG outcome, I can just say, um, how, what is the cost in billions of dollars for running the auction? How much do I have to pay the stations to buy them out? And what is the value loss in billions of dollars, which is to say, uh, how much welfare do I leave on the table uh, what, what is the kind of sum of welfare loss by all of the stations that don't get to go back on the plane? What is the sum of valuations of the stations that don't go on the plane? Now, um, as a sidebar, if you're an economically oriented person, you might wonder why I'm saying value loss rather than efficiency, like social welfare. Uh, the reason is um, social welfare gets really skewed if there's a couple of people with enormous valuations that just always go back on the plane. It just throws off the units. So it's cleaner to think about just the, the sum of the, the value that gets destroyed. And there, it's basically a constant offset apart. Uh, so what happens, I, I had no idea how this experiment was going to turn out. And I was very worried when we ran this. That it was going to turn out not to matter at all what we did. Um, you know, when you're an experimentalist, you just don't know what's going to happen. This is as pretty a picture as I could possibly have wanted. It's great. Um, so what it says is, um, in terms of both value and revenue, um, there's a completely separated cluster of points as we make the solver stronger and stronger. So this is if we only solved the 90, uh, whatever, 97 percent of trivial problems. This is if we ran the MIP solver, the better of the two MIP solvers. This is if we ran, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> this is if we ran PicoSat, which that is not the best SAT solver, but it's the SAT solver that at some point we recommended and a lot of the literature started using in response to our recommendation. Uh, and the red cluster is uh, SAT FC, which is the thing that we actually proposed at the end. And you can see, as compared to the, the greedy outcome, we, um, we would have had almost three times as much value loss. So we would have had a value loss of almost $2 billion. In terms of revenue, uh, relative to the greedy thing, we would have saved about three and a half times um, the cost for the FCC, so about uh, $5 billion of cost difference. So really, you know, these things appear to have, have made a big difference. And I think this is um, one of the most compelling examples I know of, of where really working hard on um, the computer science questions made a, a, a tangible effect on the, the outcome of a real market that happened in the world. Uh, and I think, um, I'm not 100% sure if this, Fahim can disagree with me later, but I think this is the largest dollar value single usage of SAT solvers to date. Um, chip verification is probably uh, coming in second, but I, I still think we, we might have edged them out here. So, um, yeah, the well, you know, yeah, it's fair <laughs> enough, but uh, computers are cheap. So, uh, so anyway, I think that, that's pretty exciting for the SAT community. So, so I'll leave, the, leave it there. Thanks for your attention. Uh, I've told you about spectrum reallocation, which is an important problem that uh, you know, gives us a chance to think really broadly about uh, market design, how to think about things like property rights and externalities and amount of goods to trade. Then I told you about this um, computational problem of spectrum repacking that's kind of inside that, uh, that computational problem and uh, how eventually to use this kind of deep optimization idea to automatically design algorithms that were tuned to our domain and, and get great performance. So thanks very much for your attention.